Welcome back friends. Uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, but this is the last video on this channel. Um, so for this video, I went through a list of all of the cases that we've covered on Dark Matters, Nameless, and then the one episode of Forgotten Files that aired, and I searched for any updates on said cases. But before we get into all of that, I have four announcements to sort of wrap up the channel. If you don't care about the announcements and you don't want to join in on the final live stream this weekend, I completely understand. And here is the timestamp where the case updates start. So first, just to clear this up, all of the videos currently up on the channel will remain up. I don't have any plans to remove them. I know some people were concerned about that. They will be there. They're not going anywhere as far as I know. Um, and second, the final goodbye live stream. So here's the plan. This Saturday, July 27th, I believe it's the 27th, it's this Saturday, starting at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, come to this YouTube channel and I will be streaming the game Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice all day, pretty much. It's a seven hour game, but I suck at games, so the plan is to stream from 10 a.m. EST to 8 p.m. EST. I am hoping that this is a large enough time frame that anyone who wants to drop by, whether it's for the whole thing or just for a couple of minutes, can come hang out, chat a little, and have a nice, like, positive send-off to the channel. Also, side note, Super Chats will be turned off. This is a final goodbye, and that's all it is. Um, again, this Saturday, July 27th, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope to see you there. Third, merch. Currently, you can still buy merch, and the 40% discount code still works. You can find the link to that as well as the code down in the description below, as always. Um, all that being said, I will be deleting the storefront August 31st. I think that allows anyone who wants merch still, I think everyone who wants merch has already bought it, but just in case, um, that allows everyone enough time to save for it if they want it, and gives me an official cutoff date to close shop. And... Fourth and finally, we now have a Discord server, which is also linked in the description. And with all of that out of the way, it is time for case updates. I basically searched for any news reports on every episode of Dark Matters and Nameless that was published after the video air date. Um, I was searching for new information or a medium that might provide new information on the case only, so I excluded articles marking the anniversary, uh, marches and vigils, and fictional adaptations, but I did include any new details or clues, as well as any podcasts, TV show documentaries, or books about said cases. Also, any case that has had an update, I will include a link to that episode in the description below. Phone numbers for each case can be found in the description of their individual video as well as at the end of their videos if anyone needs that information. I will provide a very brief summary before each update, but you can rewatch the corresponding episodes for a more detailed refresher. Um, out of 49 Dark Matters videos, there were only updates that I found on seven of them, and for Nameless, there were five updates. I did look through all of the cases that we covered on the one episode of Forgotten Files that aired, but there were no updates for those cases. So, let's start with Dark Matters. 21-year-old Chris Jenkins went missing on October 1st, 2002 after leaving the Lone Tree Bar in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In February of 2003, his body was found in the Mississippi River. And while the case was closed in 2004 as an apparent drowning, it was reopened in 2006 under a new classification, and no one has been charged with his death. The investigation discovery show Breaking Homicide did an episode titled Secrets of the River covering Chris's case, which aired April 29, 2018. Chris's mother, Jan Jenkins, says that the decision to air Chris's story was a difficult one, but that they wanted to raise awareness for, quote, all of the lives that are yet to be taken. The episode falls in line with what the family believes happened to Chris, according to Jan, who also mentioned that she hasn't had contact with the Minneapolis PD concerning Chris's case since 2010. 36-year-old Renee McRae and her three-year-old son Andrew resided in Inverness, Scotland in 1976. 
On November 12th, Renee dropped off her older son with her estranged husband, Gordon McRae, and drove away with Andrew, supposedly to visit a relative. Later that night, 12 miles away, Renee's BMW was spotted burning in an isolated lay-by, but Renee and Andrew were nowhere to be found. Later, it was revealed that Renee had been having an affair with a man named Bill McDowell, who was also Andrew's biological father. McDowell has denied any involvement, and no one has been charged, and Renee and Andrew haven't been found. In November 2018, investigators announced interest in tracking down a tobacco-colored antler-made suitcase and a silver cross pushchair or stroller that were believed to be in Renee's car when she left, but weren't there when the BMW was found. Police also reveal that they received an anonymous letter mentioning, quote, suspicious activity at a quarry near Inverness the night in question. In June 2019, it was reported that a nearby quarry had been drained and was being searched after authorities found wheels similar to those on the stroller that they were looking for in the silt. Several reports also mentioned bones being found, but no specifics were mentioned and police haven't refuted or confirmed this particular claim. Nine-year-old Aisha Degree was last seen by her family asleep in her bed in Shelby, North Carolina at 2.30 a.m. on February 14, 2000. But at approximately 4 a.m., truckers spotted her walking along Highway 18 a mile away from her home, alone. A year later, her backpack was found in Burke County, but she's never been seen again, and authorities believe she was kidnapped. The Cleveland County Sheriff's Office made a Facebook video concerning new clues that they think might be connected to Aisha's case, a Dr. Seuss book called McElligott's Pool that was checked out from the Falston Middle School Library, which is where Aisha went to school at the time she vanished. The second item of interest was a New Kids on the Block concert tee. They ask that anyone who might have had these items or lost track of them around the time Aisha disappeared to please contact their offices. The reward for information leading to Aisha's whereabouts is currently at $45,000. Tierra Williams is a 19-year-old from Greensboro, North Carolina, who was last seen January 7, 2016, walking near her home at Stony Brook Apartments on Webster Road. The only update I found on this case was that in May 2018, Investigation Discovery show Disappeared aired an episode covering Tierra's case. The show references an ex-boyfriend that may have more information, but his name isn't revealed due to the ongoing nature of the case. On July 17, 2016, 10-year-old Jesse Wilson was last seen by his adoptive mother, Crystal Wilson, around 9.30 p.m. Sometime in the night, he vanishes, and Crystal reports him missing the next morning. Almost two years later, on March 8, 2018, his skeletal remains are found scattered near State Route 85, about six miles from his home. Due to the state of and location where his remains were found, his cause of death couldn't be determined. No one has been charged or officially named a suspect in his case. However, police have called Crystal Wilson a lead before. A report published in May 2018 claimed Buckeye Police Department had slowly been building a no-body homicide case against her starting five weeks after Jesse vanished. More recently, News 12 obtained 400 pages of documents concerning a Department of Child Services investigation into Crystal Wilson's home. Here is what the documents revealed. In 2013, Jesse had a one-inch red and raised welt on his left cheek that he says was the result of Crystal hitting him with a belt. The children under Crystal's care often wore shoes on the wrong feet and attended school with their hair and teeth unbrushed. Jesse stated that he and his siblings always ate breakfast and lunch at school and took extra snacks with them, eating every bite on their plate as Crystal reportedly withheld food as punishment and even locked Jesse in his room for long enough periods of time that he had to relieve himself on his bedroom floor. What DCS found in Crystal's fridge only gave credence to these claims. Despite saying she didn't drink, the fridge was barren save for liquids, including a box of wine, two more bottles of wine, and liquor. Investigators found an additional 12 bottles of liquor, quote, 
on display on a dresser in her room. While Crystal said that she only withheld dessert from the kids and never physically punished them, DCS found that the door handles to the children's rooms were reversed so that they could only be locked from the outside. Also, in Crystal's room in a tub under her bed, DCS uncovered several antipsychotic medications, including Risperdal, Abilify, and Haldol. They also found Clonidine, which is often used to treat ADHD, which Crystal claimed Jesse had, despite the fact that DCS found no psychological or behavioral issues with him. Police also found Methadone, which is A, used to treat heroin, addic heroin addiction, pardon me, and B, only legally acquired through drug treatment programs. It is unknown who was prescribed these medications, as it's redacted from the documents. And finally, it was revealed that Wilson, who had previously cared for six foster children in California, had all six children taken away from her by Child Protective Services for accusations of withholding food as punishment. Her last known whereabouts were Georgia, and I want to reiterate, Crystal is a lead and hasn't been publicly called a suspect by authorities as of yet. For the Missing in New Hampshire video, we covered the disappearance of several women from New Hampshire, but only Denise Denault had a small update. Denise, 25, went missing from Manchester, New Hampshire on June 8, 1980, after a night out with friends. At the time she vanished, Denise lived just a few doors down from a man named Terry Rasmussen, now suspected to be a serial killer. In May 2018, authorities searched a wooded area in West Manchester near Kimball Street for evidence in relation to her case, though they didn't reveal why the sudden search or what they were looking for. Denise's friend, Marie Stevens, also stated that around the time her friend vanished, Denise confided in her concerning a letter that she received threatening her life. When Denise asked what she should do, Marie took the letter, ripped it up, and threw it away, calling it garbage. Looking back, Marie wishes that she still had that letter. And one other update I do want to mention, but wasn't a case we talked about in depth. I did mention it in the Missing in New Hampshire video due to its connection to the suspect, uh, Terry Rasmussen. Known as the Allenstown Four or the Bear Brook Park Murders, in 1985 and again in 2000, four unidentified female bodies were found dismembered in barrels. Later DNA tests revealed that three of the four victims were related. When Terry Rasmussen became a suspect in the case, DNA tests revealed the fourth victim was his daughter, who also remains unidentified. But as of June 2019, three of the four victims have their names back. When Detective Matt Kohler of the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit saw a forum post from 2000 on an Ancestry website claiming that a woman named Marlise Honeychurch and her daughter were missing, he decided to dig deeper. Eventually, the connection to Rasmussen was made. Marlise and her two daughters, last known whereabouts, were with Terry Rasmussen around Thanksgiving in 1978. DNA has now confirmed the victims' identities. 24-year-old Marlise Elizabeth Honeychurch and her two daughters, 6-year-old Marie Vaughn and 1-year-old Sarah McWaters. This was a huge case for authorities not only in New Hampshire, but those investigating Rasmussen's possible victims across the country. And I only hope that one day the final victim reclaims her true name as well. The Final Dark Matters update deals with 20-year-old Ashley Loring Heavy Runner, who went missing on June 8, 2017 from Browning, Montana, located in the Blackfeet Reservation. Her sister, Kimberly Loring, has headed the search for her sister when law enforcement failed to take her disappearance seriously in the initial months. At the end of the episode we did on Ashley, I mentioned that remains had been found on the reservation, but hadn't yet been identified. Reports later revealed the remains did not belong to Ashley, they were historic or ancient in age and likely belonged to a Native American man between 45 and 60 years old. Then, on February 25th, there were three small details in an article by The Guardian that I don't remember finding during my research for the episode. The first detail I hadn't heard was that Ashley messaged Facebook friends looking for a ride into town, and she seemingly found one. Her grandmother noticed that she had packed some clothes into a blue string backpack before saying goodbye and departing in her friend's car. 
I'm not sure if anyone knows who that friend is, but I don't believe it's been publicly reported. We know in the time before Ashley went missing, she was seen at a party on the reservation via a Facebook video. The Guardian article says that the video of Ashley at that party showed her sitting on a couch, surrounded by other people, drinking beers, and chatting. And the final detail says that shortly after Ashley disappeared, a witness saw a woman running from a vehicle on a desolate stretch of Highway 89. Um, the reward for information leading to the prosecution of the persons responsible for Ashley's disappearance is now at $15,000. And if you're interested, I've included a link in the description to a video that The Guardian made covering Ashley's disappearance and speaking with her sister. It's short and honestly sad to watch, but I think it really hits home how disappearances really affect this community. Now let's get into the nameless updates. Again, there are five. We will start with Bella in the Witch Elm when, in 1943, unidentified female skeletal remains were found in a hollowed-out tree in Hagley Wood, located in Worcestershire, England. The killer seemingly severed the woman's hand and forced a piece of taffeta cloth into her mouth at the time of her death, suspected to have occurred two years prior to her discovery. In 1944, a graffiti message appeared on Upper Dean Street in Birmingham reading, Who Put Bella Down the Witch Elm, Hagley Wood, which is where the case derives its moniker. Not only does Bella Doe remain unidentified, the location of her autopsy and skeletal remains are currently unknown. A book released in February 2018 titled Who Put Bella in the Witch Elm, Volume 1, The Crime Scene Revisited, revealed a never-before-seen image of the victim's face. The reconstruction was completed by Caroline Wilkinson, a professor of craniofacial identification at Dundee University. As Bella Doe's skeleton is lost, she was forced to use photos of the skull in order to create the composite image. If you're interested, the book is actually on Amazon and was written by Alex Merrill and his father, Pete Merrill, while Alex was in school studying for his GCSEs with the ultimate goal of looking at the case from a modern perspective to shine a light on its unexplored angles. The case of the Eastall woman has captured the interest of not only those in Bergen, Norway, where the incident took place, but around the world. The charred remains of an unidentified woman were found in Ice Valley or East Dalen, a remote hiking area on November 29, 1970. Any identifying marks or tags had been removed from her clothing, and she was unrecognizably burned. Later, police uncovered two suitcases, a slew of fake identities, disguises, and strange incidents surrounding the woman's final days. In June 2019, it was announced that isotope tests done on her teeth and jawbone traced the woman back to Nuremberg, Germany, and she is thought to be closer to 40 instead of 30 years old. Also, a man named Arne Magnus Vabo used a metal detector in the area where she was found and uncovered a buried handbag. Police couldn't find any additional evidence inside as it had been in the ground for decades, but they did feel it was possibly bought for a child due to the short straps and likely dated back to the Eastall woman's era. The case has seen renewed interest as of late, likely due to a podcast series called Death in Ice Valley covering the incident. You can find it on most podcast hosting platforms for those of you who want to check it out. The body of a 50 to 65 year old woman was discovered in Vernon County, Wisconsin on May 4th, 1984. Her cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head and her injuries left her unrecognizable until mortuary procedures were completed. In addition, her hands were severed at the wrists, likely to stop her from being identified through fingerprints and they have never been recovered. She remains unidentified. In May 2018, it was reported that pollen tests conducted by the U.S. Customs and Border Protection revealed the victim was likely from an urban area in the semi-arid highlands or the lowest elevation zones of the temperate Sierra, which are areas found in Arizona and New Mexico. That same month, her remains were exhumed in hopes of creating new reconstructions and sending DNA off for testing. And while the results of the tests were expected to be done within six months, there's been no further reports as of the airing of this video. 
Fond du Lac County, Wisconsin, November 23, 2008. The body of an unidentified female between the ages of 15 to 21 years old is found frozen in a creek. The advanced state of decomposition prevents determining a cause of death, but it's being investigated as a homicide. Nearby, authorities find several items of clothing, but no socks or shoes were ever recovered. In April of 2018, Doe's remains were exhumed from Cattaraugus Cemetery in hopes that DNA or isotope testing might narrow down where she was from. And later in August, the results were revealed. They believe Doe was a resident of the regions that stretches from Las Cruces and Albuquerque, New Mexico to Flagstaff, Arizona for the majority of her life. Within the year of her death, she likely lived in regions of southwest Wisconsin, southern Minnesota, and northern Iowa. Despite reaching out to law enforcement in the aforementioned areas, police haven't had any luck trying to identify her yet. And now the final update. One of the highest profile unsolved mysteries in Pennsylvania history begins on February 25, 1957, when the naked remains of a four to five year old boy are found in the Fox Chase area of Philadelphia. The boy was battered, malnourished, and left in a cardboard bassinet box, and he remains unidentified to this day. This last update is a small one, but one that I think restores a little bit of my faith in humanity, so. I wanted to share it last. Eagle Scout Nicholas Kirschbaum of Troop 522 in Wilmington made his Eagle Scout project to create a memorial where the boy was found so that he wouldn't be forgotten and in the hopes that there might be some renewed interest or that someone would finally come forward with information. The VDOC Society, a group of forensic experts who offer new perspectives on cold cases, funded the memorial, and its founder, Bill Fleischer, believes DNA may yet lead to answers in his case. And that's all she wrote, guys. Um, those are all of the updates I found on every victim we've covered in Nameless Dark Matters and that one episode of Forgotten Files. I wish there were more, um, but I'm honestly just happy to hear that there's progress on any of them. And I predict that over the next several years, there's going to be an explosion of cases solved, specifically when it comes to identifying victims and their perpetrators, likely through DNA. Um, I think we're already seeing the beginnings of it, and that's great. And while I don't know that my videos have ever helped any of these cases progress, I think it's important to hear these people's stories. And wherever you go to hear them from now on, Just keep doing what you've been doing here, Um, being respectful, remembering that these cases aren't just sensational headlines and creepy mysteries and clickbait titles, they're real people. And yeah, I hope I've done them justice in telling their stories. Um, Thank you for receiving them openly and with empathy, and thank you for being on this journey with me. I think that about covers everything, so again, Thank you for listening to these victims' stories. I hope knowing that there's some updates has wrapped up the channel in a positive direction for you. Um, For those of you who won't be at the goodbye live stream, I want to thank you for everything you've done for me, and I wish you nothing but the best going forward. Um, For those who will be there Saturday, I will see you then. And for those of you who are out there and you're considering whether or not you want to start a YouTube channel or you want to talk about these cases in some format, um, I highly encourage you to do that because it can only help to have people who research these, these cases well and present the information and get the information out there to more people. Um, yeah, as always, uh, stay safe, friends, and I hope you all have the best life if this is the last time I see you. So, yeah. Goodbye.